Tonight, students walk out, crushing the ivory trade, and the defense and attorney turned D.A. DA. In fact, I did pretty much everything you could do not to be elected. Today, Democrat Connor Lamb thanked his supporters for handing him a win in Pennsylvania's 18th congressional district, edging out Republican Rick Saccone by 627 votes. Those state officials haven't declared a winner yet. Saccone hasn't conceded either, and Republicans would likely contest a Lamb victory. The razor-thin margin of victory is a big achievement for Democrats in a district that Donald Trump won by 20 percentage points in 2016. A former Equifax executive is now facing criminal and civil charges of insider trading. The Justice Department alleges that Jun Ying, an ex-chief information officer, sold nearly $1 million in company stock after he found out about last year's huge data breach, but before it was disclosed to the public. The Securities and Exchange Commission has also filed a complaint against him. Last September, Equifax announced that the breach affected more than 145 million Americans. Ying's lawyer has not yet commented. YouTube is going to start adding text boxes that link to information from Wikipedia alongside conspiracy theory videos. The company has been criticized for promoting conspiracy theories on its platform. Most recently, one about a Florida school shooting survivor. One engineer who worked there told Vice News that YouTube's algorithm is to blame and ends up favoring that type of content. YouTube CEO Susan Wojcicki addressed the issue briefly at the South by Southwest Interactive Festival last night. Though she wouldn't say how many conspiracies the company has cataloged, she suggested the list would expand over time. The UK is expelling 23 Russian diplomats, the most it's forced out since the days of the Cold War. That decision came after Russia ignored a deadline to explain how a nerve agent the country developed was used on British soil to poison a former spy. They have treated the use of a military-grade nerve agent in Europe with sarcasm, contempt and defiance. The Russian embassy in London called the expulsion totally unacceptable, unjustified and short-sighted. The White House confirms that CNBC senior contributor Larry Kudlow has agreed to head up the National Economic Council. He'll replace Gary Cohn, who couldn't get behind the president's decision to impose tariffs on steel and aluminum imports. Kudlow is a free trade advocate who once worked for President Reagan and who's also against tariffs. It's been exactly one month since a 19-year-old gunman killed 17 and wounded dozens at Florida's Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. In Washington, hundreds of students joined a nationwide school walkout and swarmed the Capitol, calling for action on gun violence. In the House, lawmakers finally took a bipartisan step forward on addressing the issue. But the bill they passed isn't likely to satisfy demands for sweeping change. The Stop School Violence Act would essentially provide new funding for school security and violence prevention programs. And it passed the House with support from both parties. On this vote, the yeas are 407, the nays are 10. It's likely to pass the Senate later this month, and the White House has even endorsed it. The president has already voiced and the administration have voiced support for uh, both the Cornyn legislation as well as the Stop, Stop Gun Violence Act. That makes this bill the first proposal with broad bipartisan support and a commitment from the president to sign it. So it's probably not surprising that it's about the bare minimum you could possibly expect from Congress on something as divisive as addressing gun violence. This bill doesn't actually strengthen regulations or restrictions on guns. Instead, it aims to prevent school shootings by funding training to help law enforcement, school staff, and students recognize warning signs of violence. It also provides funding to establish tip lines and new school security tech. On its face, this isn't a bad idea, but it's also an old one. The bill just restarts and slightly augments a grant program that already existed, one that was part of an anti-crime bill passed in 1968. Here's what the original law looks like. Lots of bullet points and legalese. 
The Stop School Violence Act eliminates those first three bullet points, funding metal detectors, security assessments, and training, and replaces them with two new types of projects, training to prevent violence and the development of anonymous tip lines to report threats. It also adds a couple of words about creating threat assessments to the next bullet points. All these red lines and edits get you pretty much nothing, since there was already a catch-all measure in the original text. The grant program expired in 2011, so if this becomes law, it will do one major thing, provide $50 million over 10 years, starting in 2019, for schools to improve their security. That's actually $20 million more than the original program. But this is kind of what Congress does. They make rudimentary changes to the text of a law and call it a win, even if the issue people are marching about, guns, isn't really addressed. I spoke to Representative Elizabeth Esty, a Connecticut Democrat who represents Newtown and co-sponsored the bill. How will the Stop School Violence Act prevent any of this from happening in the future when a lot of these programs are already in place and there's a lot of training already happening? Well, there are a number of different aspects and a number of Sandy Hook families were involved in forming an, an organization called Sandy Hook Promise that has been doing a lot of research and has found some of these intervention programs really to be helpful. Now, again, this is a small step. Let me be very clear. This does nothing about the gun side of the equation. And we do very little to keep guns out of the hands of people who shouldn't have them. And that remains ultimately my goal. This is not really a new solution to a very old problem. Mm -hmm. So why get on board with something that you yourself admit is, is basically just a feel good bill? Well, I think that's a little unfair. I mean, again, recognize some of the people who form this are parents whose kids were killed in that school. Unlike you and unlike me, they've spent Absolutely. five years every day actually doing research and looking at some programs that are helpful. So getting programs reauthorized and more money when this administration has cut money out of programs, is not nothing and it's not easy to do. Is it a big step? No. Is it a baby step in the right direction? Yes. So what would you say to students who are disappointed with this bill and say it doesn't go far enough? They're right and keep the pressure on. It is a first step and they need to ask for another and another and another because the road is long. For a lot of American students, gun violence is an ingrained part of everyday life. At William Turner Technical Arts High School, 40 miles south of Parkland, the students walked out today, but they had a message of their own. is ignored in Liberty City and Little Havana and urban neighborhoods. The areas are already considered the hood. They make it seem like crime is normal. And when I say they, government officials, local officials, local news sources. I don't want to say they don't care about us, but they don't care about us. This area is not predominantly white, so it wouldn't get as much attention like in Parkland. I feel like gun violence is ignored in Miami because a lot of people have access to guns. Kids younger age have access to guns. You can access anything from the corner of your street. Personally, I have been affected by gun violence. One time when I was around the age of 14, I almost got caught in a shootout. In the past three years, I have to bury two of my cousins. It was a close relative pulled out a gun on me, and I feel like it was heartbreaking. My cousin, um, who died eight years ago, was unfortunately shot in front of her son by an unknown perpetrator, and ever since then, I've been adamant about gun control and how we need to change our regulations. The solution would be gun control, not taking away guns in general, but to limit who can get them and how e how readily available they are to people. We walked out today to, in support of those 17 people who lost their lives at Stoneman Douglas, but are also walking out for those 316 kids who have lost their lives in Miami-Dade County alone from 2006 to 2016, and numbers continue to grow, and our mission here is to stop that number.
The American criminal justice system gives local prosecutors enormous discretion, and historically, they've used it in service of a harsh law and order agenda. But in the past few years, a wave of reform-minded district attorneys has been elected across the country, including in Philadelphia. David Noriega met the most unlikely of them all. Thank you all for being here. I gotta tell you, I get a little embarrassed by some of these things because people keep thanking me, and it wasn't me voting. It was 150,000 people voting, not for me, but for a movement. Larry Krasner's first public meeting as the district attorney of Philadelphia was unusual. For one thing, DAs don't typically engage eye to eye with veteran black liberation activists, let alone find things to agree on. You still have people that's inside these prisons that's not getting proper health care, that are dying inside the prison, that come from Philadelphia, that was sent there by Philadelphia district attorneys. There has not been adequate medical access for people in state prisons or county prisons for time immemorial. The reality is that is completely wrong. This is the actual oath of office. Talks about discharging the duties of your office with fidelity, but it never really says what the duties are. Just kind of leaves that vague. There are a lot of things that make Krasner an atypical DA, starting with the fact that he's never prosecuted a criminal case before. He made his name as a defense attorney, representing activists and suing the Philadelphia police 75 times. Did you ever think you would be the district attorney of Philadelphia? No, I really didn't. In fact, I did pretty much everything you could do not to be elected. Like what? Give me an example. Like associating myself with Occupy, with Black Lives Matter, with activists of all sorts of stripes who were in disfavor and who were frankly scary to a lot of people. Out of the 10 biggest cities in the U.S., Philadelphia has the highest per capita rate of incarceration. And before Krasner, Philly DAs sold themselves as tougher than the toughest criminals. But Krasner's message was the opposite. He campaigned on reversing mass incarceration. That message resonated in Philly, where a majority of the population is made up of people of color, many of whom have been dealing with the criminal justice system their whole lives. Krasner drew far more voters than any DA in recent memory, and he trounced his opponents in both the Democratic primary and the general election. This is a movement that is tired yeah. of seeing a system that is systematically picked on poor people, primarily black and brown people. His campaign was also lifted by a national movement for criminal justice reform and by a one and a half million dollar campaign donation from George Soros. There is, without question, a national movement towards having progressive prosecutors all over the country. It's in Chicago, it's in San Francisco, Houston. It's happening quickly. The rate of winning is high, and I think our race was just one more example of that. How would you describe the ultimate goal of that movement? The ultimate goal is to take resources away from uh, an exploded incarceration industry and put them into things that actually prevent crime and heal society. You have someone in the person of Jeff Sessions at the helm of the Justice Department who has views that are pretty much diametrically opposed to Did you to say yours. person? What are you implying? Jeff Sessions was such a notorious racist when he was a young man that he was rejected from the federal bench. He is, frankly, America's worst nightmare when it comes to criminal justice. But the good news is the feds actually have very little in the way of law enforcement resources and law enforcement is overwhelmingly controlled by local prosecutors and local police departments. What would make you want to work for this questionable DA's office? Krasner has only been in office since January, but he's already shaken things up. In his first week, he fired 31 people he said didn't share his vision. Now he spends a lot of his time doing job interviews. So we should schedule him to come in person. Great. For a face-to-face, -face. all right? Yep. Krasner also revealed that the okay. DA before him kept a list of bad cops who weren't allowed to testify in court. He stopped charging low-level marijuana possession cases, and he recently announced he would stop seeking cash bail for most minor offenses. This is imprisonment for poverty, and it is time for us as a criminal justice system to do better. So far, the activists who got Krasner elected have reason to be happy but they're keeping an eye on him. 
the Coalition for a Just DA, which brought together various grassroots groups to get out the vote for Krasner, has kept on meeting every week, in their words, to hold Larry accountable. The people who raised alarms about Krasner talk about being afraid that he wants not to reform the criminal justice system, but essentially to dismantle it. Is that what you all want? An unjust system or an, an oppressive system deserves to be dismantled. Mm. And I can't speak for uh, D.A. Krasner. But if he did want to dismantle the system, I say there's nothing wrong with that. It should be dismantled. Krasner's positions and those of the activists who supported him disturbed many in the criminal justice establishment. Krasner drew intense fire from the police union, which accused him of being anti-law enforcement. He also made people angry with his attacks on the office he was trying to take over. In May, a group of former prosecutors released a letter calling Krasner a radical candidate who was dangerous to the city. One of those former prosecutors is Guy D'Andrea. Do you think the picture that Larry Krasner painted of the district attorney's office over the course of his career and particularly during the campaign is fair? The way he categorized it, it just, it sickened me. And when I hear that the prosecutors are in the office are this bloodthirsty, you know, all we want is a conviction. No, what we want to do is help people who have been victimized. That's all we want to do. That message put a very dark cloud on the office. Those tensions are bound to boil over eventually. For now, the police union is being conciliatory, at least in public. They declined our request for an interview and gave us a statement saying they look forward to working with Krasner to make our great city safer. But the relationship is still tense. In a recent letter to police cadets, the union slammed Krasner for suggesting that cops could get in trouble for firing their guns unnecessarily. And no one, including Krasner, thinks this is going to be the last fight of his career as district attorney. It seems to me that unless you compromise significantly on some of the platform that you ran on, you will inevitably wind up pissing off large swaths of the criminal justice establishment. We already pissed them off. That's okay. And that's why when we started the campaign and we laid out the entire agenda, including certain things that were considered a political death knell, voters were drawn to it because they were tired of hearing mealy-mouthed, half-assed answers from people who don't want to take a position. Is it going to piss off the political establishment, or at least the criminal justice establishment? It is. Is that a good thing? Yes. Is change necessary? Yes. And this is how you achieve change. I will be remembered for my work on black holes and the origin of the universe, not for things like appearing on The Simpsons. But I'm an optimist. I have had to be so in my personal life. Even when things are dark, there's hope. So we shouldn't despair of the human race. into it. How did you decide that this is what you were going to wear today? I just wanted something a little more metropolitan, but at the same time still still keeping a level of uh, GQ. Step back, please. Oh, yeah. That's the right height? Yep. Perfect. Okay, good. Jesse Palick is a lieutenant for the Department of Environmental Conservation's Crimes Investigation Unit. Bye, Dawn. We'll see you in a little bit. Which means he's basically a nature cop. Part of his job is to stop the illegal sale of ivory in the state of New York. All right, guys, it's go time. Today, that means that he and a fellow officer are going to try to catch an art dealer in the act of selling ivory. To do that, they've dressed up as art connoisseurs. Catching a dealer in the act is just the first step to prosecuting them. It's a long process, and city officials didn't want us to blow the agent's cover, so we blurred their faces. We also agreed to delay releasing footage from the operation so as not to jeopardize their efforts. Today is June 14th, 2017. At approximately 1550 hours, attempted undercover buy with Lieutenant Jesse Pollock.
Hello. Hi. Hello there. Hi, hello, I'm Robert. Brock? No, I'm Brock, we've met before, but yes. again. Robert. Anything um, new that we'd be interested in since we were last year? So recently. Um, I know, we were only here a couple weeks ago. Yeah. But not that I can think of. Okay. okay. There's always a level of paranoia mm -hmm. because you know who you are. Right. So you automatically think that these people are going to know who you are. How can you fight against that? The best thing to do is just to hide in plain sight and act normal. Go in there and don't freak out. If you want to you know what that away. actually is? Is that a sight? I believe it's ivory. Okay. I think it's ivory. Okay. In 2014, New York State tightened restrictions by making the sale of elephant or even mammoth ivory completely illegal. The only sales that are allowed are those of articles that contain less than 20% ivory and that have paperwork showing they're more than 100 years old. Selling ivory under any other circumstance is a crime. You know, some of the ivory today, they don't even let you because they came a lot from elephants, tusk and everything. They yep. don't even allow the sale of them. You know, I mean, back in the day, a lot of it was original ivory that yeah. maybe came from that. Again, yeah. I don't know. But today, there are a lot of restrictions. And they're not selling you anything. I know. I know. Okay, so good. Yeah. All right, well, so I'm yeah. not telling you anything you don't know. No, no. I, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, you know, to get original ivory, you still got a lot of people, even the, even the Chinese, there, that do collect it, but yep. it's almost a black market. The authorities say this small figurine is part of a huge illegal market. So it's, it's 2,700? Yeah. yeah. The ivory trade in the U.S. is estimated to be a $23 billion industry, and New York City is its hub. Between 30 and 40,000 elephants are poached each year. That's one elephant killed every 15 minutes. Because of this, experts estimate that the total number of elephants left in the wild is now fewer than 500,000. George Amato is the director of the Sackler Institute for Comparative Genomics at the American Museum of Natural History. For decades, he's been helping the DEC confirm the presence of ivory in seized items. How do you tell that this, these pieces here are ivory? It looks like ivory from a distance in terms of its color and all of that, but you can actually see these lines, they're called Schrager lines, okay. and they're very diagnostic of elephant ivory. So you don't even need to take samples, you see these lines and you can immediately say elephant ivory. You can immediately say elephant ivory. Confirming that the statue contains ivory is what Jesse and his team needed to get a warrant. We've got two different uh, initiatives here. The first thing is going to be the entry. On a Wednesday afternoon last July, they staged another meetup with the art dealer, this time with backup. So upon entry, we'll serve the search warrant. While we're doing that, you guys are going to stage at the main building to the entrance. On the target, there's a side entrance. You guys are going to go inside, sweep the location, let's take control of those computers, and let's turn off the closed circuit surveillance. And that is it, guys. Oh, my God. The salesperson that sold you the statue, yes. you arrested today. We did. And in this case, he wouldn't voluntarily leave, so we made a judgment call just to arrest him, you know, on what we have so far and get him off the property so we could just go in there and do what we need to do. By the time the bus was over, Jesse and his team claimed they had seized three other ivory pieces worth $36,000, which they later authenticated. The dealer, Robert Rogal, told us that the seized pieces were not made of ivory and that the statue he sold contained less than 10% ivory and was more than 100 years old. He was kept in custody overnight and released after his arraignment. Good morning, everyone. We're going to get the program started. Thank you. A month later, the DEC organized an ivory crush in Central Park. The purpose of the event was to send a message that New York City doesn't tolerate the sale of elephant ivory. I can't help thinking that today is a great day for elephants and a really bad day for ivory traffickers. It was there, amid a crowd filled with animal rights activists, politicians, and celebrities, that we saw Robert Rogal, the art dealer recently arrested by Lieutenant Palak's team. 
Hi, my name is Ariel. I'm a reporter from Vice News tonight. Would you be willing to talk to us on camera? Yes, absolutely. Some ivory was seized from one of your stores, correct? Uh, no, that's not correct. A bronze sculpture mm -hmm. made of bronze had a couple of ivory elements. So you think that, what is it? Is it the amount of ivory that was on the statue that bothers you? You think it's too small? It didn't bother me, mm -hmm. it bothered them. Mm -hmm. To me, it was not even an issue that it was any ivory involved in it. These are small elements. I was involved in the making of the bronze. We just buy and sell. So whose responsibility would it be to kind of monitor what a piece of art is made of, if not yours? Uh, I, I think the responsibility lies within the artist. It doesn't lie within the dealer. Why the ivory crush? Why is that something that, that you wanted to witness yourself? Well, because I believe a lot of the items that they're confiscating are vintage items that you go to a museum and the fact that they're destroying art uh, in today's world is similar to maybe what the Nazis did in confiscating art. Th these people are speaking now and today like there are whales and elephants in Central Park and that we're saving the world. The case against Rogal is currently pending pre-indictment in Queens County Court. In a phone call today, he told us that the case is, quote, costing me my reputation over a ridiculous thing I wasn't even aware of. Today, we're not only crushing the massive hall of confiscated material you see here, we're also crushing the entire supply chain that continues to bring this illegal ivory into the United States. That's Vice News Tonight for Wednesday, March 14th.